today I want to focus on reaching the unreached. Because for us as a church, and uh, to, to, for us as a church to be effective with what we are doing, we need to reach the unreached. We need to be aware that we have an incredible blessing in our life that should be shared. You know, uh, just like uh, I think it was Darren was mentioning before, but a, a blessing shared is a blessing doubled. A burden shared is a burden halved. Has anyone ever heard that? Right? And that's the incredible thing about the community of the church is that truly and eternally, with an eternal answer, when you share your burden, it's halved. And likewise, with the blessing that you have been given. And we need to be willing to be able to speak about our faith using every opportunity to preach that good news. Amen? Come on, let's thank the band here today. You guys are awesome. I love it. It's kind of like a little family band up here because Brittany and Sean are getting married. How many, how many months? Three months. All right, that's great. Incredible. So we want to uh, make sure that we are willing and able and equipped to share the good news of the gospel. And I wanted to spell one, uh, one kind of thing that maybe the thought is in your mind that I am the preacher here. Uh, I am actually not the preacher. I am the equipper. Anyone who is standing up here is the person that has a tool and they're giving it to you and saying, this is how you use the hammer. You don't need to hang it on your wall. Don't, you know, so it looks like you do your own house renovations. No, you use that. And, and so that's what I am here today is the equipper. The real preachers of the church is actually you. You go out into your world throughout the week and you preach the gospel, the good news through various ways so that we can reach the unreached. And so today's message is called Preach, funnily enough, with the P in parentheses because I want us to understand that preaching is not, you don't have to set up a pulpit in your workplace and say, repent, you need to be baptized in the blood of Jesus and come here, the harvest is ripe. You know, you don't need to be in that sense, but it is just reaching people by speaking the truth that you know. And so uh, I want to first start with why should we be sharing the gospel as Christians? And the first reason, uh, and you can write this down, this is incredibly deep and is going to be life-changing for you, is because the Bible told me so. I know, mind-blowing. In Mark 16, verse 15, it says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This is what's called the Great Commission. It is not the great choice. It is not the great omission. And I feel like sometimes we can subject ourselves to God as Savior, and He has saved us, and that's, and that's good enough. No, He has saved us not to just be saved, but so that we would be sent. It is not just about conversion. It is about commission that He gives to us. This is purely the purpose that God has given us as Christians. Jesus came on mission. He lived on mission. He died in mission. He rose on mission. And He left His disciples, including all of us who follow Him here today, on mission. Like I said before, conversion is about commission, not just salvation. Because we're not saved to solely being saved, but saved to be sent. Redemption is a life-saving rescue, but it also involves a profound rewiring and repurposing within our life. We are saved to go out into the world for the glory of our Jesus, to make Him known as our Lord, as our Savior, and as our greatest treasure. And honestly, I think that this is a foundational answer to the question that all of humanity has. What is my purpose here? 
what is the meaning of life? And, uh, you know, I said before, I can try and find this complicated answer. That's a complicated question, right? What is the meaning of life? Does anyone have an answer, like, off the top of their head? What is the meaning of life? That you, You're going to have to go down some Jordan Peterson rabbit holes, and we want to find these eloquent ways in, in, uh, in finding out what that purpose is. But it's very quite simple that we would follow Christ and that we would be a gigantic arrow that points others towards Christ. That we would actually live out the Great Commission within our worlds. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I want you to say that. I am a chosen person. Let's try that again. I am a chosen person, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. He has sent you to declare His name. There is more than just being called a special possession or a holy nation or a royal priesthood, but I need you to see yourself in that light. You have invited Christ into your heart to be a part of His family to be a part of His covenant that He has made with us as His children. And He wants us to declare His goodness. He wants us to declare His greatness in the worlds that He has put us in. Amen. So the first reason, because the Bible told me so. You can just keep saying that to yourself. The second reason we need to share the gospel is because you are a blessed person. Psalm 116, 12 to 14 says, What can I offer the Lord for all He has done for me? It's a really good idea to look back upon your journey with God and write down the blessings that have happened in your life because of a relationship with Christ. David continually uh, writes, sings in the Psalms, I remind myself of the good things He has done in my life. The reason being is it puts substance and a reminder through every season, the good, the bad, maybe the mundane, that God is a good God. He will prevail. He will get you through, and there is a purpose. What can I offer the Lord for all He has done for me? All of that gratitude, what can I do? David says, I will lift up the cup of salvation And praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Jesus has saved your life. Do you count that as a blessing, church? You count that as a blessing? Do you you recognize that your life is very different in an incredibly way better way than it was at the point you met him? Can you see the two outcomes, the little turn, the slight turn that has sent you on a different mode of life? The way to bring back blessing to God in that sense is to lift the cup of His salvation. I don't know someone who will hide their blessing. If I came up to you, uh, one of our awesome women, and I gave you a Balenciaga bag. I don't know. Is that a good bag, sweetie? Well, first of all, my wife might be pretty angry at me. She's like, where's my bag? But my guess is, is that you are going to wear that thing and you're going to say, oh, this is incredible. This was given to me as a gift. This is so awesome. I'm going to treat it uh, with, with some nice leather rub or whatever. If I, came up to, if I came up to a guy and I said, all right, I've got an original 70s Ford Bronco. This is yours. It's souped up. It looks awesome. It's incredible. You're not going to put that in the garage with the cover on it. You're going to call all your friends over and say, oh man, you've got to sit in this. Let's drive down the PCH. Let's show this thing off. Who in God's great, big, beautiful world would hide a blessing like eternal life? Like a hope that never dies and a purpose that never disperses. We need to understand the significance and the beauty of the gift that has been given to you. 
You didn't have to do anything to earn it. You didn't have to go through a religious order. You didn't have to uh, penance yourself. You didn't have to do that. This was a free gift given to you by the willing spirit of Jesus and the great plan of God. Billy Graham has an incredible quote. He says, our faith becomes stronger as we express it. A growing faith is a sharing faith. If you feel weak in that area, begin to share about the goodness of God in your life. It will begin to strengthen that resolve that you already know within you. It will put to voice the the great blessing that you have. In Isaiah, it says, I send the word forward out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I have sent it to do. There is power in the words that you speak. There is power in talking about the gospel of peace. And so this week, you got those two reasons? Because you were blessed. Because the Bible told me so. I love it. I want to talk out of a a scripture here today that as I was reading this story this week, it just kind of hit me in uh, almost a a prophetic sense uh, as a kind of uh, commission in itself for me as a Christian, for me as a believer of Christ, for me as a part of a church community here in our great city. And it's the story Uh, One of the greatest stories of conversion, and that is of Paul. Everyone know who Paul is? Yeah. Did everyone have a coffee this morning? (laughs) Paul used to be called Saul, right? And Saul was a very zealous, devout Pharisee to the Mosaic law. And when Jesus came, I don't know if you knew this, but the message of Jesus caused a lot of social disruption, (laughs) I don't know if today you might feel so fearful of bringing up what you, uh, the substance of your life, the substance of why your life is so good because, oh, it's, uh, I feel like I'm walking around on eggshells. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to bring up a fight. The social setting right now is quite tense. Well, it, it's been tense for quite some time. So in going back and reading this, you can understand that there are people who have walked through this before. I can walk through this today and find that boldness that is necessary. So, uh, so, so Saul is this incredibly zealous person, this uprising with which they labeled the way. That was the first uh, name for Christians, this movement of people who were following Jesus were called the way. He went to the Pharisees and he said, give me the authority to go and persecute these people. Give me the authority to bind them in chains, to bring them back to Jerusalem so that they may be tried, they may be convicted, some be put to death, uh, all of their possessions taken. Give me the power. So he, he, he hated Christians. He was in a complete uh, adversary to the belief that Jesus died and resurrected and the people who were following him. On the way to Damascus, he's empowered by the state, by the Pharisees to go and lock up these people. He has an incredible moment as he is nearing a city called Damascus. And in Acts 9, 3 to 6, we read, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? A great side note, just to keep in your mind, Jesus asked 307 questions in the New Testament, and he answered only a few. (laughs) I think to be an effective witness, you want to be a great question asker. You want to know the destination where you would like the conversation to go, and then you ask questions that lead you to the particular point. Even here, the first words Jesus speaks to Paul, or to Saul in this case, is a question. Why do you persecute me? Saul asks back, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 
And that verse 6 struck me within my spirit. Now, get up and go into the city. And so I'm going to be talking on those three points here today, the first of which is now. Do it now, because sometimes later becomes never. Has anyone ever heard that? Did anyone in this room uh, ever have a dream of, well, you don't have to put your hand up, but writing a book? Right? Okay. So, and, and, and the, the issue was, oh, I just need more time. I just need more time and space to myself. And 2020 came around and provided almost a perfect little space for you to be able to focus in, knuckle down, no distractions, and write a book. Did anyone write the book? Oh, you did? Wow, that is fantastic. Come on, let's give it up. But most of the time, it's procrastination and the fear of completing something in the moment called now that we begin to lose the moment. And I believe that God is no doubt a God of the now. He moves suddenly, even just as he met uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. It says, suddenly, a light appeared around him. It knocked him off the horse and he was on the ground. God moves in a very sudden way. And in Hebrews 11, it talks about faith in that way as well. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I need that now faith in the particular moments where I'm confronted with an opportunity to speak about the good news of the gospel or to reveal the nature of why I act the way that I act. I don't need a whole lot of faith for yesterday. Yesterday is done. And to be honest, for me, I I kind of need more faith. The need for the faith of right now far outweighs even the faith that I need for tomorrow. Because faith without works is dead, which means that there is a work that has to happen right now. So I need to activate that in the moment when it presents itself. So how does this relate to preaching the gospel, to reaching the unreached. Well, I believe we're offered a lot of opportunities to speak about the good news that we have, but withhold from doing so because of a moment of fear, whether it's fear of rejection, fear of response, fear of a fight, fear of it not working out, fear of saying the wrong thing. So we withhold, we procrastinate. We might say to ourselves, oh, just get prepared and use tomorrow. The enemy of faith isn't doubt. It's okay to want, have a wonderment within you. The enemy of faith is fear. And you've heard me speak on that before, that with, without a little element of doubt, I know it's something that I can complete. But faith is the gap that God fills. And so I, there needs to be a gap when, when I am in a situation where faith needs to be activated. But fear is a freezer. It will, it will keep you frozen like a deer in the headlights. It'll keep you skittish back and forth. It'll keep something hidden within you. Maybe you change the subject quickly or maybe you relate your good deeds to being a good person. In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Not everyone in the room, everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When we live a life as people who follow Christ, I would hope that you are seen as a person of good deeds, right? that you, you go the second mile, that you shut down gossip in the workplace, that you don't look at people as a rung in the ladder to step on and uh, excel your career to a higher place, that you are, uh, have a long-bearing patience with people, that you bring peaceful resolve to conflict, that people would see your good deeds, that people would see your good reactions and take notice, Right? So my question is, are we willing 
to speak on the truth and the foundation of where those good deeds come from. These good deeds are like seeds that grow and multiply within a person's mind to go, I don't understand why you live like this. What is the context of your life? This is the reason why we act as Christians in all circles, why we act as Christians in all homes, so that the inquisitive nature of why do you react like that? Why do you live your life so differently can be answered with the good news. You know, if I was God, I would kind of poke my head through the clouds and say, hello, (laughs) what's up, children? Here's, not Johnny, God, here's Yahweh. (laughs) And I'd be like, so you all recognize me now. But he, he didn't do that because he saved you so that you could be sent into these rooms so that you could be his representative within all places. Humans connect with humans. And so those good deeds, when you're asked about what is the context of this, like why why do you respond like that? Don't respond with the latest atomic habit that you just read about and this is why my life is better. Don't respond with the latest Tim Ferriss little piece of, work wisdom that he gives you. Respond with the context that Jesus is your Savior. And there can be many ways to talk about that. Man, I struggled with my patience for so many years, but being in a community, our community at church, and we meet in small groups, we get together. I got to say the power of prayer has changed my life. To which way will you shed that light? To which way will you point the glory? And it takes now faith that we would be emboldened to speak about that. We don't just put the light under the basket and keep the rest of the room in the darkness. Oh, isn't it crazy that you might talk about your atomic habit? I don't know why I'm speaking on that. I think I just read the book. But, but uh, we might just relate it to that. That is giving that glory. You know that. That is giving that magnificence for the change within your life. There is a deeper reason for that. And when we let that light shine, it gives context to the life we live and the intent of the decisions we make, all of it pointing back to God. So I want to ask, in what areas of life are you covering your light? In what, in what rooms do you quickly put the light under a bowl? To which people do you kind of hide the significance of? Maybe it's a fear of being accountable from that point on. (laughs) That you might now have to live up to the call that you have been called to live. What opportunities are you letting pass you by that could change someone's life? Who is in our lives that are hurting and broken, that we are hiding a light from. We need to build the confidence and boldness to speak God's truth. I want us to practically just take away uh, that we would commit to working Jesus naturally into our everyday conversations. Talking about truth, not disguised, Just being bold with the fact that your life is different because of Jesus. Make the decision today to let your light shine. You know, if you feel like you're at lack of confidence uh, for those kinds of conversations, this is the reason why we have neighborhood groups. So that we can get together and we can discuss and talk about our faith. That you can uh, have a a sanctuary for asking the questions that need to be asked. We also have coming up this year and is the vision for our church, Alpha Courses that are launching. And actually, we have a dear friend here from Australia, Ben Higgins, who uh, runs the Alpha Youth program in all of Australia, right? Yeah, come on, let's welcome Ben here today. These are spaces to invite people into that they can... Uh, ask these questions in a safe uh, space and discover the purpose of their life 
um, in, in the context of these courses. And so I'm excited for that. In uh, Luke 6.45, it tells us where we get to a place of which we speak of God. It says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If you are filled up with God, it will come naturally. Whatever grips the heart wags the tongue. (laughs) That's such a funny visual to me. Whatever grips the heart wags the tongue. Uh, Whatever is holy and set apart and studied on will, uh, will overflow in what you speak about. If you love crypto, you're, you're going to talk about it at every party, right? You, you've studied it, you've meditated on it, you've invested in it. So you will talk about this at an overflow. Let's do the same for the Savior of the world. Awesome. Second point is get up. It says, now get up and go into the city. After Paul fell on the ground and he laid out there for a moment, Jesus said, get up. Doesn't take long for God to turn conversion into commission. Some of us may have been following Christ for some time now. And we are living a redeemed life. We're living a saved life, but we are living in a prone position. Yet to witness, yet to serve, yet to give, yet to reach the unreached by preaching the good news, yet to fully commit yourself to that great commission. But God wants you to get up and to take a stand and to be armed with His light and with His truth and bold enough to be able to use it. It's so uncomfortable to be armed with so much purpose, with so much truth and never initiating it. In Ephesians 6, 13 to 15, it says, Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I can't imagine... And it goes on and it talks about the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation. I can't imagine it very comfortable to be in a sitting position with all of the armor on. I got the, I got the, the sword sticking into the ground, the breastplate's kind of big and the helmet's kind of lopsided. You're not called to be armed and sitting. It says, be armed and stand firm. You will find purpose when you actually activate what you are armed with, when you use it as it's meant to be used. I love that it says, and your feet will be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That sounds unique to you, that something is tailored to your feet so that you can be, so that you can be ready. Yeah, I do plyometrics <laughs> fitted with readiness speaks to me as your testimony I feel like sometimes we can get to that point of being saved and redeemed and, and we kind of leave our testimony behind the old bless you the old life that we live could feel shameful it could feel oh that's yesterday I don't want to talk about it I want to encourage you to pick up that testimony and carry it with you. In Luke 5, 24 to 25, it says, Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Jesus told him to pick up his mat. That's his testimony. That what used to hold him, he now holds it. And by the power of Jesus, he was set free and liberated from that. For what he once depended on, he now holds by the power of Jesus. You have a testimony. It literally just means evidence given by a witness. You have evidence as a witness to the power of Jesus. I know you've witnessed him move in your life. Don't forget about the power of talking on that. You may not 
have had a physical healing as such like this man. But I can guarantee you that you had a lame heart or a lame purpose or a lame mental state, an addiction that created a limp in your life that Jesus set you free from. I certainly did. I never want to hide the power of that story because what it is, is it's His story in your story. It's His great big arc story like Pastor Jake talked about, the context and our life living within that context. Here's a helpful way that you can prepare that. How it was, there's three sections. How it was, your life before Christ. You don't need to spend a huge amount of time on that. You know, we like to say that, you know, I was a Colombian drug lord and then, you know, I, I you know, was a crazy assassin. Or I don't, I don't know. I wasn't. Just, but how it was, what happened, which is your longer section, the point when Jesus met with you and how it is now. How it is now is your longest how the power of God has continued to work in your life. Prepare a two-minute version, prepare a five-minute version, prepare a 10-minute version, so that for any situation, your feet are fitted with the readiness, that you feel prepared as you walk into those circumstances. My last point here today is what Jesus ended with. He said, now get up and go into the city. I love that Jesus told Paul to go into the city. We're not called to be secret sages or hidden hermits with the truth of the gospel within us. He's called us to go into the city that He has given you. And I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by this great commission of go into all the world and preach the good news. I want you to just go into your world and preach the good news to your family, to your neighbours, to your work associates, to your relatives, that you would give context to the way that you live. So just look at your world, look at your workplace, your favourite restaurants, your bars, your family, your friends, and begin talking about the source of your light. Romans 10, 13 or 14 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That leaves no room for anyone out. No No one is left out. That means ample opportunity to speak to anyone about the truth of God. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? I tell you today that you are sent. Not just saved to be saved, you are saved to be sent. Begin to speak of the goodness of God, not solely leaving it to your good deeds, but in your conversations, there is power in your spirit when you speak the Word of God over someone's life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Instill that within your spirit. Lift up the faith in the eyes of other people by speaking the truth that you know, and you are not alone in this. That's why we have a church that meets on Sundays. That's why we have neighbourhood groups that meet throughout the week. That's why we're launching Alpha courses. That's why we do something like Vision Builders, is that we see a city full of people who need a Saviour, and they're replacing a true Saviour with the faux versions of a Saviour. Those versions that keep you thirsty and coming back and depleting purpose, diminishing hope. But we have the answer. So we're not reserved to just now get up and hang out within my circles, but to go into the cities that God has given you. Begin acting like and thinking like that, that you are a sent missionary of God. You are a sent representative of Jesus. One of the sad verses in the Bible, it says in Matthew 9.37, and I want us to be encouraged by this because I believe 
that we are a church that works. It says, Then He said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's commit as a church to be workers in the field for Christ. Dedicated to growing His church. Dedicated to seeing His kingdom come on this earth. Dedicated to putting in the sweat equity that we are expected to have as believers in Christ. Not one that sits back and sits down in His armour, but stands up, puts the light on a sand, and says, I will raise the cup of my salvation so that all can see the blessing of my life comes from the ultimate source of it. And that is Jesus. Amen. What a great time. Thank you, Father. I thank you here today. God, I pray that we would be equipped, that we would be emboldened to be able to stand up in places that we may not have stood before. That God, if we see there might be a bowl over the light, that we would rip that bowl off, we would shatter it so that we can shine so brightly for the eternal nature of You being seen. Your eternal nature of love, God, that we would see ourselves as ministers of Your Gospel, that we would make us effective. And I, I speak out against any kind of timidity or fear that might withhold the answer of life. God, we stand within Your power. We don't try and do this in our might. We don't try and do it in our wisdom, but we do it by the might of Your Spirit. And God, we stand upon Your truth. We seek Your face in all circumstances, that You would make us able-minded, able-spirited, and fitted with the readiness to share Your good news. And we all said, Amen. Amen.